The Adventure of the Devil's Foot. In recording from time to time some of the curious experiences and interesting recollections which I associate with my long and intimate friendship with Mr. Sherlock Holmes, I have continually been faced with difficulties caused by his own aversion to publicity. To a somber and clinical, cynical spirit, all popular applause was always abhorrent, and nothing amused him more at the end of a successful case than hand over the actual exposure to some orthodox official, and to listen with a mocking smile and general chorus of misplaced congratulation. It was indeed this attitude upon the part of my friend, and was certainly not any lack of interesting material, which has caused me of late years to lay very few of my records before the public. My participation in some of his adventures was always a privilege which entailed me a direction and reticence upon me. It was then, with considerable surprise, that I received a telegram from Holmes last Tuesday. He has never been known to write a telegram where I serve. In the following terms, why not tell them of the Cornish horror, the strangest case I've handled? I have no idea what backward sweep of memory had brought the matter fresh to his mind, or what freak had caused him to desire that I should recount it. But I hastened before another cancelling telegram may arrive to hunt out the notes which give me the exact details of the case, and to lay the narrative before you, my readers. It was then, in the spring of the year 1897, that Holmes' iron constitution showed some symptoms of giving way in the face of a constant hard work and most exacting kind, aggravated, perhaps, by occasional indiscretions of his own. In March of that year, Dr. Moore Agar of Harley Street, whose dramatic introduction to Holmes I may some day recount, gave positive injunctions that this famous private agent would lay aside all his cases and surrender himself to complete rest, if he wished to avert an absolute breakdown. That state of his health was not the matter in which he himself took in the faintest interest, for his mental detachment was absolute, but he was induced at last, on the threat of being permanently disqualified from work, to give himself a complete change of scene and air. Thus it was that in the early spring of that year we found ourselves together in a small cottage near Polto Bay, at the further extremity of the Cornish Peninsula. It was a singular spot, and one particularly well suited for the grim humour of my patient. From the windows of our little whitewashed house, which stood high upon a grassy headland, we looked down upon the whole sinister semicircle of Mounts Bay, an old death trap of sailing vessels, with its fringe and black cliffs and surge-swept reefs on which innumerable seamen had met their end. With a northerly breeze it lies placid and sheltered, inviting the storm-tossed craft to track it into rest and protection. Then comes a sudden swirl around of the wind, the blustering gale from the southwest, and the dragging anchor, the lee shore, and the last battle in the creaming breakers. The wise mariner stands far out from that evil place. On the seaside our surroundings were as somber as the sea. It was a country of rolling moors, lonely, dun-coloured, with occasional church tower to mark the site of some old-world village. In every direction upon these moors there were traces of some vanished race, which had passed utterly away, and left as, as its sole record strange monuments of stone, irregular mounds which contained the burned ashes of the dead, and the curious earthworks which hinted at prehistoric strife. The glamour and mystery of the place, with its sinister atmosphere and forgotten nations, appealed to the imagination of my friend, and he spent much time on long walks and solitary meditations upon the mole. The ancient Cornish language had also arrested his attention, and he had, I remember, conceived the idea that it was akin to the Chaldean, and that had been largely derived from Phoenician readers in ten. He had received consignment of books upon philology, and was settling down to develop his thesis, when suddenly, to my sorrow, and to his unfeigned delight, we found ourselves in the land of dreams, plunged into a problem at our very doors, which was more intense, more engrossing, and infinitely more mysterious than any of those which had driven us from London. 
A simple life was precipitated into the midst of the series of events which caused the utmost excitement, not only in Cornwall, but throughout the whole west of England. Many of my readers may retain the recollection of what was called at the time the Cornish Horror. Thought the most imperfect account of the matter reached the London press. Now, after thirteen years, I will give the true details of this inconceivable affair to the public. I have said that the scattered towers marked the villages which dotted the wall of Cornwall. The nearest of these was Hammer, Hamlet of Tredenick Wallace, where the cottages of a couple of hundred inhabitants clustered round an ancient, moss-grown church. The vicar of the parish, Mr. Roundhay, was something of an archaeologist, and as such, Holmes made his acquaintance. He was a middle-aged man, portly and affable, with a considerable fund of local store. At his invitation, we had taken tea in the vicarage, and had come to know, also, Mr. Mortimer Turgenis, an independent gentleman, who has increased the clergyman's scanty resources by taking rooms in his large, straggling house. The vicar, being a bachelor, was glad to come to such an arrangement, though he had little in common with his lodger. He was a tall, thin, bespectacled man, with a stoop which gave him the impression of an actual physical deformity. I remember that during our short visit we found the vicar garrulous, but his lodger was strangely resident, a sad-faced, introspective man, sitting with averted eyes, brooding apparently upon his own affairs. These were the two men who entered abruptly into our little sitting room on Tuesday, March the 16th, shortly after our breakfast hour, as we were smoking together, preparatory to our daily excursion upon the moors. Mr. Holmes, said the vicar in an agitated voice, the most extraordinary and tragic affair has occurred during the night. It is the most unheard of business. We can only regard it as some providence that you should chance to be here at the time. For in all of England, you're the one man we need. I glared at the intrusive vicar with no friendly eyes, but Holmes took his pipe from his lips and sat up in his chair like an old hound who hears a view hello. He waved his hand to the sofa, and our palpitating visitor, with his agitated companion, sat by his side on it. Mr. Mortimer Terrigret was more self-contained than the clergyman, but the twitching of his thin hands and the brightness of his dark eyes shows that they shared a common emotion. "'Shall I speak or you?' asked the vicar. "'Oh, you seem to have made the discovery, whatever it may be, and the vicar to have it second hand. Perhaps you would better do the speaking,' said Holmes. I glanced at the hastily clad clergyman with the formerly dressed lodger seated beside him, with an amused at the surprise Miss Holmes' simple deduction had brought to their faces. Perhaps I had best say the few words first, said the vicar, and then you can judge if you will listen to the details of Mr. Trigonus and whether or not we should hasten to the scene of the mysterious affair. I may explain, then, that our friend here spent the last evening in the company of his two brothers, Owen and George, and his sister Brenda at their house in the Trinic Water, which is near the old stone cross upon the moor. When he left them shortly after ten o'clock, playing cards around the dining room table, in excellent health and spirits, this morning, being an early riser, he walked from that direction before breakfast, and was overtaken by the carriage of Dr. Richards, who explained that he had just been sent for for a most urgent call to Trinoch Wather. Mr. Mordor uh, Trigenis naturally went with him. When he arrived at Trinoch Wather, he found an extraordinary state of things. His two brothers and his sisters were seated around the table exactly as he had left them, the cards still spread in front of them, and the candles burnt down to their sockets. The sister lay back stone dead in her chair, while her two brothers sat on either side of her laughing and shouting and singing, their senses stricken clear out of them. All three of them, the dead woman and two demented men, retained upon their faces an expression of utmost horror, a convulsion of terror which was dreadful to look on. There was no sign of the presence of anyone in the house except Mrs. Porter, the old cook and housekeeper, who declared that she had slept deeply and heard no sound during the night. Nothing had been stolen or disarranged, and there is absolutely no explanation of what the horror which could be frightened the woman to death and two strong men out of the senses. There is the situation, Mr. Holmes, in a nutshell, and if you can help us to clear it up, you will have done a great work. 
I had hoped that in some way I could coax my companion back into the quiet which had been the object of our journey. But one glance at his intense face and contracted eyebrows told me how in vain was now the expectation. He sat for some little time in the silence, absorbed in the strange drama which had broken upon our peace. I will look into this matter, he said at last. On the face of it, it would appear to be a case of a very exceptional nature. Have you been there yourself, Mr. Rambe? Oh, Mr. Holmes, Mr. Tregenis brought back the account to the vicarage, and I at once buried, hurried him over to consult you. How far is it from the house where the singular tragedy occurred? About a mile inland. Then we shall walk there together. But before we start, I must ask you a few questions, Mr. Mortimer Trogenis. The other had been silent all this time, but I had observed that his more controlled excitement was even greater than the obtrusive emotion of the clergyman. He sat with a pale, drawn face, his anxious gaze fixed upon Holmes, and his thin hands clasped convulsively together. His pale lips quivered as he listened to the dreadful experience which had befallen his family, and his dark eyes seemed to reflect something of the horror of the scene. "'Ask what you like, Mr. Holmes,' he said eagerly. "'It is a bad thing to speak of, but I will answer you the truth.' "'Tell me about last night.' "'Well, Mr. Holmes, I stopped there, as the vicar had said, "'and my elder brother George proposed a game of whilst afterwards. "'We sat down till nine o'clock. "'It was a quarter past ten when I moved to go. "'I left them all round the table, as merry as could be. "'Who let you out?' "'Miss Porter had gone to bed, so I let myself out. "'I shut the door, hall door behind me. "'The window of the room in which they sat was closed, "'but the blind had not been drawn down.' There was no change in the door and window this morning, nor for any reason to think that any stranger had been in the house. And yet, there they sat, driven clean mad with terror, and Brenda lying dead of fright, with her head hanging over her arm on the chair. I'll never get the sight of this room out of my mind, as long as I'll live. The facts, as you state them, are certainly most remarkable, said Holmes. I take it that you have no theory yourself which can be the way out of them. It's the devil, Mr. Holmes, the devil, cried Mortimer Trinicus. It's not of this world. Something has come into that room and dashed the light and reason out of their eyes. What human contrivance could do that? I fear, said Holmes, that that is a matter of beyond humanity is certainly beyond me. We m yet we must exhaust all natural explanations before we fall back onto such a theory as this. As to yourself, Mr. Trinicus... I take it that you were divided in some way from your family since they lived together and you had rooms apart. That is so, Mr. Holmes, though a matter is past and done with. We were a family of ten miners in Redruth, but we sold out our venture to the company and so retired with enough to keep us. I won't deny that there was some feeling of the division of the money and it stood between us for some time, but it was all forgiven and forgotten, and we were the best of friends together. Looking back at the evening upon you spent together, does anything stand out in the memory as throwing any possible light of the tragedy? Think carefully, Mr. Treganus, for any clue which might help me. Uh, there's nothing at all, sir. Your people were in their usual spirits. Never better. Were they nervous people? Did they ever show any apprehension of coming danger? Nothing of the kind. You have nothing to add, then, which could assist me. Mortimer Trogenis considered earnestly for a moment. There is one thing that occurs to me, he said at last. As we sat on my table back to the window, and my brother George, being a partner in cards, I was facing him. I saw him look once hard over my shoulder, so I turned around and looked also. But the blind was up and the window was shut. But I could just make out the bushes of the lawn. It seemed to me for a moment that he saw something among them. I couldn't say if it was man or animal, but I just thought that there was something there. When I asked him what he was looking at, he told me that he had had some feeling. That was all I have to say. Did you not investigate? No, the matter passes unimportant. You left them then, without any premonition of evil? None at all. I am not clear how you came to hear the news so early this morning. I'm an early riser and generally take a walk before breakfast. 
This morning I had hardly started when the doctor in his carriage overtook me. He told me that old Miss P Porter had sent the boy down with an urgent message, and I sprang in beside him, and we drove on. When we got there, we looked into that dreadful room. The candles and fire must have been burnt out hours before, and they were all sitting there in the dark until dawn had broken. The doctor said Brenda must have been dead at least six hours, and there was no signs of violence. She just lay across the arm of her chair with that look on her face. George and Owen were singing snatches of songs and gibbering like two great apes. It was awful to see. I couldn't stand it, and the doctor was as white as a sheet. Indeed, he fell into a chair at the sort of faint, and we nearly had him on our hands as well. Remarkable. Most remarkable, said Holmes, rising and taking his hat. I think, perhaps, we had better go down to Treadmill Wartha without further delay. I confess that I have seldom known a case which at first sight presented a more singular problem. Our proceedings of the first morning did little to advance the investigation. It was marked, however, at an onset of an incident which left the most sinister impression upon my mind. The approach to the spot at which the tragedy occurred is down a narrow, winding country lane. While we made our way along, we heard a rattle of a carriage coming towards us, and stood aside to let it pass. As it drove by, I caught a glimpse through the closed window of a horribly contorted, grinning face glaring out at us. Those staring eyes and ghastly gnashing teeth flashed past like a dreadful vision. <clears throat> My brothers, cried Mortimer Tennis, white to his lips. They're taking him to Helston. We looked with horror at the black carriage, lumbering upon its way. Then we turned our steps towards the ill-omened house in which they had met their strange fate. It was a large and bright dwelling, rather a villa than a cottage, with a considerable garden which was already, in that Cornish air, well filled with spring flowers. Towards the garden, the window of the sitting-room fronted, and from it, according to Mortimer Grenis, must have come that thing of evil in which, by sheer horror, in a single instance, blasted their minds. Holmes walked slowly and thoroughly among the flower-pots and along the path before we entered the porch. So absorbed was he in his thoughts, I remember, that he stumbled over the watering-pot, upset its contents, and deluged both our feet in the garden path. Inside the house we were met by the elderly Cornish housekeeper, Mrs. Porter, who, with the aid of a young girl, looked after the wants of the family. She readily answered all Holmes's questions. She had heard nothing in the night, her employers had all been in the excellent spirits lately, and she had never known them to be more cheerful or prosperous. She had fainted with horror upon entering the room in the morning, and had seen the dreadful company round the table. She had, when she recovered, thrown open the window to let in the morning air, and in the run, hauled down the lane, sent the f she sent the farm lad to the doctor. The lady was in her bed upstairs, if we cared to see her. It took a long, it took a strong men from the brothers for the asylum carriage. She would not herself stay in the house under a day, and was starting that very afternoon to rejoin her family at St. Ives. We ascended the stairs and viewed the body. Miss Brenda Trogenis had been a very beautiful girl, though now verging upon middle age. Her dark, clear-cut face was handsome, even in death, but there still lingered upon it something that had convulsion of horror which had been her last human emotion. From her bedroom we descended to the sitting room where this strange tragedy had actually occurred. The charred ashes of the overnight lay in the fire. The table were the four guttered and burnt-out candles, with the cards scattered over its surface. The chairs had been moved round back against the wall, but all else was as it had been the night before. Holmes paced with light, swift steps about the room. He sat in various chairs, drawing them up, and reconstructing their positions. He tested how much of the garden was visible. He examined the floor, the ceiling, and the fireplace. But never once did I see that sudden brightening of his eyes and tightening of his lips, which would have told me that he saw some gleam of light in this utter darkness. Why a fire? he asked at once. Had they always a fire in this small room on a spring evening? Mortimer Trigenis explained that that night was cold and damp. For that reason, after his arrival, the fire was lit. What are you going to do about it now, Mr. Holmes? he asked. My friend smiled and laid his hand upon his arm. I think, Watson, that I shall resume the course of tobacco poisoning which you have often so justly condemned. Said he, 
With your permission, gentlemen, we will now return to our cottage, for I am not aware that any new factor is likely to come to our notice here. I will turn the facts over in my mind, Mr. Tregenis, and should anything occur to me, I will certainly communicate with you and the vicar. In the meantime, I wish you both a good morning. It was not long until I, after until we were back at the Potu cottage that Holmes broke his complete and absorbed silence. He sat coiled in his armchair, his haggard and ascetic face hardly visible amid the blue swirl of his tobacco smoke, his black brows drawn down and his forehead contracted, his eyes vacant and far away. Finally, he laid down his pipe and sprang to his feet. It won't do, Watson, he said with a laugh. Let us walk along the cliffs together and search for flint arrows. We are more likely to find them than clues to this problem. To let the brain work without sufficient material is like racing an engine. It racks itself to pieces. The open sea air, the sunshine, and patience, Watson. All else will come. Now, let us calmly define our position, Watson. He continued as we skirted the cliffs together. Let us get a firm grip of the very little which we do know so that the fresh facts arise, we may be ready to fit them into their places. I take it, in the first place, that neither of us is prepared to admit diabolical intrusions into the affairs of men. Let us begin by ruling that entirely out of our minds. Very good. There remain three persons who have been grievously stricken by some conscious or unconscious human agency. That is a firm ground. Now, when did this occur? Evidently, assuming from his narrative to be true, it was immediately after Mr. Mortimer Tregenis had left the room. That is a very important point. The presumption is that it was in the few minutes afterwards. The cards still lay upon the table. It was already past their usual hour for bed. They had not changed their position or pushed back their chairs, I repeat. Then that occurrence was immediately after his departure, and not later than eleven o'clock at night. Our next obvious step is to check, so far as we can, the movements of Mortimer Trogenis after he left the room. In his, in this there is no difficulty, as they seem to be above suspicion. Knowing by methods as you do, you were, of course, suspicious of the somewhat clumsy water party expedients by which I obtained a clearer imprint of his foot that might otherwise have been impossible. The wet, sandy path took it admirably. Last night was also wet, you remember, and it was not difficult, having obtained a simple print, to pick out his track among the others to follow his movements. He appears to have walked away swiftly in the direction of the vicarage. If, then, Mortimer Tregenis disappeared from the scene, and yet some outside person affected the card players, how can we reconstruct that person, and how was such an impression of horror conveyed? Mrs. Porter may be eliminated. She is evidently harmless. Is there any evidence that someone crept up to the garden window in some manner to produce so terrific an effect that drove those who saw it out of their senses? The only suggestion is the direction comes from Mortimer Treganus himself, who says that his brother spoke out about some movement in the garden. And that is remarkably certain, as the night was rainy, cloudy, and dark. Anyone who have had the design to alarm these people would be compelled to place his very face against a glass before he could be seen. There is a three-foot flower border outside the window, but no indication of a footmark. It is difficult to imagine, then, how an outsider could have been so terrible an impression upon the company, nor have we found any possible motive for so strange and elaborate an attempt. You perceive our difficulties, Watson. They are only too clear, I answered with conviction. And yet, with a little more material, we may prove that they are not insurmountable, said Holmes. I fancy that among your intensive archives, Watson, you may find some which were nearly as obscure. Meanwhile, we shall put the case aside until more accurate data are available, and devote the rest of our morning to the pursuit of Neolithic man. I may have commented upon my friend's power of mental detachment. But I'd never have wondered at it more than upon the spring morning in Cornwall, when for two hours he discerned upon kilts, arrowheads, and shards, as lightly as if no sinister mystery was waiting for his solution. It was not until we had returned in the afternoon to our cottage that we found a visitor waiting us, who soon brought our minds back to the matter at hand. Neither of us needed to be told who that visitor was. 
The huge body, the craggy and deeply seamed face with fierce eyes and hawk-like nose, and grizzled hair which was nearly brushed our cottage ceiling. The beard, golden in fringes with white nether lips, gave the nicotine stain from the perpetual cigars. All these were known in London as in Africa. It could only be associated with the tremendous personality of Dr. Leon Sterndale, the great lion hunter and explorer. We had heard of his presence in the district, and had once or twice caught sight of this tall figure upon the Molan Pass. He made no advance to us, however, nor would we have dreamed of doing so to him, as it is known that it is his love of seclusion which caused him to spend the greater part of the intervals between his journeys in a small bungalow buried in the lonely wood at Beauchamp Ariens. Here, amid his books and his maps, he lived an absolutely lonely life, attending to his own simple wants and praying little apparent heed to the affairs of his neighbors. It was a surprise to me, therefore, to be hear him asking Holmes in an eager voice whether he had made any advance in his reconstruction of the mysterious episode. The country police are utterly at fault, said he, but perhaps your wider experience has suggested some conceivable explanation. My only claim to being taken in your confidence is that, during the many residences here, I have come to know this family, of Treganus, very well. Indeed, upon my Cornish mother's side, I could call them cousins, and their strange fate has naturally been a great shock to me. I may tell you that I have got as far as Plymouth upon my way to Africa, but the news reached me this morning, and I came straight back to help in the inquiry. Holmes raised his eyebrows. Did you lose your boat through it? I will take the next. Dear me, that is friendship indeed. I tell you they were relatives. Quite so, cousins of your mother. Was there baggage aboard the ship? Some of it, but the main part at the hotel. I see. But surely this event could not have found its way into Plymouth morning papers. No, sir, I had the telegram. Might I ask from whom? Shadow passed over the gaunt faces of the explorer. You're very inquisitive, Mr. Holmes. It is my business. With an effort, Dr. Sterndale recovered his ruffled composure. I have no objection to telling you, said he. It was Mr. Rounder, the vicar, who sent me the telegram, which recalled me. Thank you, said Holmes. I may say in answer to your original question, I have not cleared my mind entirely on the subject of the Manticade. But that I have every hope in reaching some conclusion. I would be premature to say more. No, I can hardly answer that. No. Perhaps you could not mind telling me if your suspicions point to any particular direction. No, I can hardly answer that. Then I have wasted my time and do not need to prolong my visit. The famous doctor strode out of our cottage in considerable ill humor, and within five minutes Holmes had followed him. I saw him no more until the evening, and when he returned with a slow step and haggard face which assured me that he had made no great progress in his investigation, he glanced at his telegram which awaited him, and threw it into the grate. From the Plymouth Hotel, Watson, he said, I learned the name of it from the vicar, and I wired to certain people to make Dr. Leon Sterndale's account was true. It appeared that he did indeed spend last night there, and that he actually allowed some of his baggage to go into Africa while he returned to present at this investigation. What do you make of that, Watson? He is deeply interested. Deeply interested, yes. There is a thread there which we have not yet grasped, and which might lead us through the tangle. Cheer up, Watson, for I am very sure that our material has not yet come at hand. When it does, we may soon leave our difficulties behind us. Little did I think how soon the words of Holmes would be realized, or how strange and sinister would be the new development which opened up an entirely fresh line of investigation. I was shaving at the window in the morning when I heard the little rattle of hoofs, and looking up, saw a dog cart coming at a gallop down the road. I pulled up at our door, and our friend the vicar sprang from it and rushed up our garden path. Holmes was already dressed, and we hastened down to meet him. Our visitor was so excited that he could hardly articulate, but at last in gasps, Burson's tragic story came out of him. We're devil risen, Mr. Holmes. Our poor parish is devil ridden, he cried. Satan himself is on the loose in it. 
when I had given it over into his hands. He glanced about in his agitation, a ludicrous object as if it were not from his ashy face and startled eyes. Finally, he shot out his terrible news. Mr. Mortimer Tregenis died during the night, and with the exact same symptoms as the rest of his family. Holmes sprang to his feet, all energy in an instant. Can you fit us both in your dog cart? Yes, I can. Then, Watson, we will postpone our breakfast. Mr. Roundhay, we are extremely at your disposal. Hurry, hurry, before things get disarranged. The lodger occupied two rooms of the vicarage, which were at an angle by themselves, one above the other. Below was a large sitting room, and above his bedroom. He looked out upon the croquet lawn which came up to the windows. He had arrived before the doctor or the police, so that everything was absolutely undisturbed. Let me describe exactly the scene as we saw it upon that misty March morning that has left an impression which can never be effaced from my mind. The atmosphere of the room was of a horrible and depressing stiffness. The servant who had first entered had thrown up the window, or it would have been most even more tolerable. This might partly be to the fact that the lamp was stood flaring and smoking at the center table. Beside it stood the, sat the dead man, leaning back in his chair, his thin beard projecting, his spectacles pushed up on his forehead, and his lean dark face turned towards the window, and twisted into the same distortion of terror which had marked the feature of his dead sister. His limbs were convulsed, and his fingers contorted, as though he had died in the very proxima of fear. He was fully clothed, though th there were signs that his dressing had been done in a hurry. We had already learned that his bed had been slipped in, and that the tragic end had come to him in the early morning. One realized the red-hot energy which underlay Holmes's phlegmatic exterior when he saw the sudden change which came over him in the moment that he entered the fatal apartment. In an instant he was tense and alert, his eyes shining, his face set, his limbs quivering with eager activity. He was out on his lawn, and out through the window, and round the room, up the bedroom, and for all the world, dashing foxhound drawing a cover. In the bedroom he made a rapid cast about, and ended up by throwing open the window, which appeared to give him some fresh cause of excitement, for he leaned out with an ex loud ejaculations of interest and delight. Then he rushed down the stairs, out through the open window, and threw himself down upon his face on the lawn, sprang up into the room once more with all the energy of a hunter who was at the very heels of his quarry. The lamp, which was extraordinarily standard, he examined with minute care, making certain measurements upon its bowl. <coughs> he carefully scrutinized with his lens the talc shield which covered the top of the chimney and scraped some of the ashes which adhered to its upper surface, putting some of them into an envelope, which he placed into his pocketbook. Finally, just as the doctor and the official police had arrived in appearance, he beckoned the vicar, and all three went out upon the lawn. I am glad to say that my investigation has not been entirely barren. He remarked, I cannot remain to discuss the matter with the police, but I should be exceedingly obliged, Mr. Roundhay, if you would allow the inspector and give him my compliments and direct his attention to the bedroom window and to the sitting room lamp. Each is suggestive, and together they are almost conclusive. If the police would desire any further information, I shall be happy to see any of them at the cottage. Now, Watson, I think that perhaps we shall be better employed elsewhere. It may be that the police resented the intrusion of an amateur, or that they imagined themselves to be upon some hopeful line of an investigation. But it was certain that we heard nothing from them for the next two days. During this time, Holmes spent some of his time smoking and dreaming in the cottage. But a greater portion of the country walks which he undertook alone, returning after many hours without remark as to where he had been. One experiment showed me that in the line of his investigation. He had brought a lamp which was a duplicate of that which burned in the room of Mortimer Trinaganus on the morning of the tragedy. He had filled it with the same oil that was used in the vicarage, and he carefully timed the position of which it would take to be exhausted. Another experiment which he made was of a more unpleasant nature, and one which I am not likely to ever forget. You remember, Watson, he remarked one afternoon, 
that there is a common point of resemblance in every varying report that have reached us. This concerns the effect of the atmosphere in the room in which case had been first entered. You recollect that Mortimer Tregenis, in describing the episode of his last visit to his brother's house, remarked that the doctor had gotten into the room and fell into a chair. You had forgotten. Well, I can answer for that what it is now. You remember that Mrs. Porter, the housekeeper, told us that she herself fainted upon entering the room and had afterwards opened a window. In the second case, that of Mortimer Tregenis himself, you cannot have forgotten that horrible stiffness of the room when we arrived. Though the servant had thrown open the window, that servant, I found upon inquiry, was so ill that she had gone to bed. You admit, Watson, that these facts are very suggestive, in each of these evidence of a poisonous atmosphere. In each case, also, there is a combustion going on in the room. In one case, the fire, in the other, the lamp. The fire was needed, and the lamp was lit, as a comparison the oil consumed will show, long after it was broad daylight. Why? Surely because it was a connection between these three things. The burning, the stuffy atmosphere, and finally, the madness or death of those unfortunate people. That is clear, is it not? It would appear so. At least we may accept that as a working hypothesis. We will suppose, then, that something was burned in each case which produced an atmosphere causing strange toxic effects. Very good. In the first instance, that of the Jorganis family, the substance was placed in the fire. Now the window was shut, but the fire would naturally carry fumes to some extent of the chimney. Hence, one would expect the effects of the poison to be less than that of the second case, where there was less escape for the vapor. The result seems to indicate that it is so, since in the first case only the woman, who had presumably been more sensible organism, was killed. The other is exhibiting a temporary or permanent lunacy, which is evident in the first effect of the drug. In the second case, the result was complete. These facts, therefore, seem to bear out the theory that the poison which worked by combustion. With this train of reasoning in my head, I naturally looked about the Mortimer Trenag in his, his room to find the same remains of the substance. The obvious place was to look was a talc shield, a smoke guard of the lamp. Sure, there enough. I perceived a number of flaky ashes, and round the edges of the fringe of brownish powder, which had not been consumed. Half of this I took, as you saw, and placed it in an envelope. Why half, Holmes? It is not for me, my dear Watson, to stand in the way of the official police force. I leave them all the evidence which is found. The poison still remained in the talc, and they had the wits to find it. Now, Watson, we will lamp, light our lamp. We will, however, take the precaution to open our window to avoid the premature decease of the two deserving members of society. And you will seat yourself near the open window in the armchair. Thus, like a sensible man, you determine to have nothing to do with the affair. Oh, you will see it out, will you, Watson? I thought I knew my Watson. This chair I will place opposite yours, so that we may have the same distance from the poison, face to face. The door we will leave ajar. Each is now in a position to watch the other to bring the experiment to an end should the symptoms seem alarming. Is that all clear? Well then, I take our powder, or what remains of it, from the envelope, and I lay it above the burning lamp. So, now Watson, let us sit down and wait our developments. They were not long in coming. I had hardly settled into my chair before I was conscious of a thick, musky odour, subtle and nauseous. At the very first whiff of it, my brain and my imagination were beyond all control. A thick black cloud swirled before my eyes, and my mind told me that in this cloud, unseen as yet, was about to spring upon my appalled senses, lurking all that was vaguely horrible, all that was monstrous, inconceivably wicked in the universe. Such a mince and warning of something coming, the evidence of some unspeakable dweller upon the threshold, whose very shadow would blast my soul. A freezing horror took possession of me. I felt that my hair was rising, that my eyes were protruding, and that my mouth was opened, and my tongue like leather. The turmoil within my brain was such that something was surely a snap. 
I tried to scream and was only vaguely aware of some hoarse croak, which was my own voice, and distant and detached from myself. At the same moment, in an effort to escape, I broke through that cloud of despair and had a glimpse of Holmes's face, white, rigid, and drawn with horror, the very look which I had seen upon the features of the dead. It was a vision which gave me an instant of sanity and strength. I dashed from my chair, threw my arms around Holmes, and together we lurched through the door and had an instant afterwards been thrown ourselves upon the grass plot and were lying side by side. Conscious only of the glorious sunshine which was bursting its way through the hellish cloud of terror which had girt us in. Slowly it rose from our souls like the mists of the landscape, until a peace and reason had returned, and we were sitting upon the grass, wiping our clammy foreheads, and looking with apprehension at each other to the mark uh, last traces of the terrific experience which we had gone and had gone. Upon my word, Watson, said Holmes at last, with an unsteady voice, I owe you both my thanks and an apology. It was an unjustifiable experiment, even for oneself, and undoubtedly so for a friend. I'm really very sorry. You know, I answered with some emotion, for I had never seen so much of Holmes's heart before, that it is my greatest joy and privilege to help you. He relapsed at once into the self half-humorous, half-cynical vein, which was his habitual attitude to those about him. "'It would be superfluous to drive us mad, my dear Watson,' he said. "'A candid observer would certainly declare that we were so already before I embarked on so wild an experiment. I confess that I never imagined the effect would have been so sudden or so severe.' He dashed into the cottage, and reappearing with a burning lamp, held it at a full arm's length. He threw it upon the bank and brambles. We must give the room a little time to clear. I take it, Watson, that you no longer have a shadow of a doubt as to how these tragedies were produced. None whatsoever. But the cause remains as obscure as ever. Come into the arbor here, and let us discuss it further. That villainous stuff seems to linger down my throat. I think we must admit that all the evidence points to this man, Mortimer Tregenis, having been the criminal in the first tragedy though he was a victim of the second one. We must remember, in the first place, that there is some story of a family quarrel, followed by a reconciliation. How bitter that quarrel may have been, and how whole was the reconciliation, we cannot say. When I think that Mortimer Tregenis, with a foxy face and small shrewd beady eyes behind the spectacles, he is not a man whom I would judge to be of a particularly forgiving disposition. Well, in the next place, you will remember that this idea of someone moving in the garden, which took our attention for a moment from the real tragedy of the case, emanated from him. He had a motive in misleading us. Finally, if he did not throw the substance into the fire at the moment of leaving the room, who did so? The affair happened immediately after his departure. Had anyone else come in, and the family would have certainly risen from the table. Besides, in peaceful Cornwall, the visitors do not arrive after ten o'clock. We may take it, then. All the evidence points to Mortimer Tregenis as the culprit. Then his own death was suicide. Well, Watson, it is on the face of it not an impossible proposition. The man who had the guilt upon his soul of having brought such a fate upon his own family might well be driven to remorse and inflicted upon himself. There are, however, some cognate reasons against it. Fortunately, there is one man in England who knows all about it, and I have made arrangements by which we shall hear the facts this afternoon from his own lips. Ah, he is little before his time. Perhaps you would kindly step this way, Dr. Leon Sterndale. We have been conducting a chemical experiment indoors, which has left us a little hardly fit for reception and a distinguished so visitor. I heard the click of the garden gate, and now the majestic figure of the great African explorer appeared upon the path. He turned in some surprise towards the rustic arbor in which we sat. You sent for me, Mr. Holmes. I had your note about an hour ago, and I've come. Though I really do not know why I should obey your summons. Perhaps we can clear the point up before we separate, said Holmes. Meanwhile, I'm much obliged to you for your courteous questions. You'll excuse us this informal 
reception in the open air, but my friend Watson and I have furnished an additional chapter to what the papers call the Cornish Horror, and we prefer to clear the atmosphere at the present. Perhaps since the matters which we have to discuss will affect you personally, it is a very intimate fashion, it is as well as we should talk where we can have no eavesdropping. The explorer took a cigar from his lips and gazed sternly at my companion. I'm at a loss to know, sir, he said. What you have to speak about, which affects me personally in a very intimate fashion. The killing of Mortimer Tregenis, said Holmes. For an instant I wished that I were armed. Sir Dale's fierce face turned to a dusky red, and his eyes glared, and the knotted passionate veins started from his forehead, while he sprang forward with clenched hands towards my companion. Then he stopped, and with a violent effort, he resumed the cold, rigid calmness, which was perhaps more suggestive of danger than his hot-headed outburst. I live so long among savages and beyond the law, said he, that I've got into the way of being a law myself. You would do well, Mr. Holmes, not to forget it, for I have no desire to do you an injury. Nor have I any desire to do you an injury, Dr. Sterndale. Surely the clearest proof of that is, knowing what I know, I have not I have sent for you and not for the police. Sir Doe sat down with a gasp, overawed for perhaps the first time in his adventurous life. It was a calm assurance powers in Holmes's manner which could not be withstood. Our visitor stammered for a moment, his great hands opening and shutting with agitation. What do you mean? he asked, at last. Is this a bluff upon your part, Mr. Holmes? You have chosen a bad man for your experiment. Let us have no more beating around the bush. What do you mean? I will tell you, said Holmes, and the reason I will tell you is that I hope frankness may beget frankness. What my next step will be will depend entirely upon the nature of your own defense. My defense? Yes, sir. My defense against what? Against the charge of killing Mortimer Tregenis. Sir Dale mopped his forehead with his handkerchief. Upon my word, what are you getting on? Said he. Do all your success depend upon the prodigious power of bluff? The bluff, said Holmes sternly, is upon your side, Dr. Leon Strange, and not upon mine. As a proof, I will tell you some of the facts upon which my conclusions are based. Of your return to Plymouth, allowing much of your property to go to Africa. I will say nothing save that it first informed me that you were one of the factors which had been had to be taken into the reconstruction of this drama. I came back. I have heard your reasons in regard of them unconvincing and inadequate. We will pass that. You came down here to ask me whom I suspected. I refused to answer you. Then you went to the vicarage, waited outside for some time, and finally returned to your cottage. How do you know that? I followed you. I saw no one. That is what you may expect to see when I follow you. You spent a restless night at your cottage, and you formed certain plans, which in the early morning you proceeded to put out into execution. Leaving your door just as the day was breaking, you filled your pocket with some reddish gravel that was lying heaped beside your gate. Sterndale gave a violent start and looked at Holmes in amazement. And then you walked swiftly for a mile which separated you from the vicarage. You were wearing, I may remark, the same pair of ribbed tennis shoes which you are present momently on your feet. At the vicarage you passed through the orchard on the left side hedge, coming out under the window of the lodger Tregenis. It was now daylight, but the household was not yet stirring. You drew some gravel from your pocket and threw it up at the window above you. Sir Dale sprang to his feet. I believe you are the devil himself, he cried. Holmes smiled at the compliment. It took two or possibly three handfuls before the lodger came to the window. You beckoned him to come down. You dressed hurriedly and descend he dressed hurriedly and descended to his sitting room. You entered by the window. There was an interview, a short one, during which you walked up and down the room. Then you passed out and closed the window, standing on the lawn outside smoking a cigar and watching what occurred. Finally, after the death of Dragenis, you withdrew as you had come. Now, Dr. Sterndale, how do you justify such conduct, and what were the motives of your actions? 
If you previgorate or trifle with me, I will give you my assurance that the matter will pass out of my hands forever. Our visitor's face had turned ashen gray as he listened to the words of his accuser. Now he sat for some time in thought, and his face sunk into his hands. Then, with a sudden impulsive gesture, he plucked up the photograph from his breast pocket and threw it upon the rustic table before us. This is why I've done what he said. He showed the bust and face of a very beautiful woman. Holmes stooped over it. Brenda Tregennis, he said. Yes, Brenda Tregennis, repeated our visitor. For years I've loved her. For years she's loved me. There is a secret at Cornish seclusion which people have marveled at. It has brought me close to one thing on earth that was dear to me. I could not marry her, for I have a wife who has left me for years, and yet whom, for the deplorable laws of England, I could not divorce. For years Brenda waited. For years I waited. And this is what we have waited for. A terrible sob broke from his great frame, and he clutched his throat under the bridled beard. Then, with an effort, he mustered himself and spoke again. The vicar knew he was in our confidence. He would tell you that she was an angel upon earth. That is why he telegraphed me, and I returned. What was my baggage for West Africa to me when I learned that such a fate had become my darling? Here you have the missing clue to my action, Mr. Holmes. Proceed said my friend. Dr. Sterndale drew from his pocket a paper packet and laid it upon the table. On the outside was written, Ritus Pedis Diabloli, with a red poison label underneath it. He pushed it towards me. I understand you're a doctor, sir. Have you ever heard of this preparation? Douglas Foot Root. No, I have never heard of it. It is no reflection upon your professional knowledge, said he, for I believe that, save for one sample in a laboratory in Buda, there is no other specimen in Europe. It has not yet found its way either into pharmacopoeia or into the literature to toxicology. The root is shaped like a foot, half human, half goat like, and it's a fanciful name given by the botanical missionary. It was used in the ordeal poison by the medicine men in certain districts of West Africa, and it is kept a great secret among them. This particular specimen I obtained under very extraordinary circumstances in the Vigandi country. He opened the paper as he spoke, and then closed a heap of reddish-brown snuff-like powder. Well, sir, asked Mr. Holmes, I'm about to tell you, Mr. Holmes, all that actually occurred, for you already know that so much about it so clearly that my interest is that you should know it all. I have already explained the relationship in which I stood with the Dragatis family. For the sake of my sister, I was ready with the Brenda's. There was a family quarrel about money which estranged this man Mortimer, but it was supposed to be made up, and afterwards met him as did other, several others. He was a sly, subtle, scheming man, and had several things rose which gave me a suspicion of him, and I had no cause for any positive quarrel. One day, only a couple of weeks ago, he came down to my cottage and I showed him some of my African curiosities. Among other things, I exhibited this powder and I told him of its strange properties, how it simulates those brain centers which control the emotion of fear, and how either madness or death is the fate of an unhappy native who is subjected to the ordeal of the priests of his tribe. I told him how the powerless European science was to detect it, and then how he took it I cannot say, for I never left the room. But there is no doubt that this is with them. While I was opening cabinets and stooping the boxes, that he managed to abstract some of the devil's root powder. I well remember how he applied me with his questions about it at the moments and the amount of time that was needed for the effect, but I little dreamed that he could have given a personal reason for asking. I thought no more about the matter until the vicar's telegram reached me at Plymouth. This villain had thought that I would be at sea before the news would reach me, and that I could see lost for the Africa in years. But I returned at once. Of course, I could not listen to the details without feeling assured that my poison had been used. I came around to see you on the chance that some other explanation had been suggested itself to you. But there could be none. I was convinced that Mortimer Tregatis was a murderer, that for the sake of money, and with the idea that perhaps... That if some other family members of his family were insane, he could be the sole guardian of the joint property. 
he had used the devil's foot powder upon them, driven two of them out of their senses, and killed his sister Brenda, the one human being whom I have ever loved, and who, have, who has ever loved me. There was his crime. What was his, to be his punishment? Should I appeal to the law? Where were my proofs? I knew that the facts were true, but I could hope to make an injury of and jury of countrymen believe so fantastic a story. I might or might not. But I could afford to fail. My soul cried out for revenge, and as I've said to you before, Mr. Holmes, that I've spent much of my life outside the law, and that I've come at last to be the law myself. So it was now. I determined that the fate of which had been given to the others should be shared by himself. Either that or I would do justice upon him with my own hand. In all England, there can be no man who sets less value upon his own life than I do at the present moment. Now, I have told you all. You have yourself supplied the rest. I did, as you say, after a restless night, set off early at my cottage and foresaw the difficulty of arousing him. So I gathered some gravel from the pile which you have mentioned and I used to throw it up to the window. He came down and admitted to me through the window of the sitting room. I laid no offense before him. I told him that I'd come back out as justice, judge and executioner. The wretch sank down into a chair paralyzed at the side of my revolver. I lit the lamp, put the powder above it, and stood outside the window, ready to carry out my threat to shoot him should he try to leave the room. In five minutes he died. My God, how he died. But my heart was flint, for he endured nothing which my innocent darling had not felt before him. There was my story, Mr. Holmes. Perhaps if you loved a woman, you would have done as much yourself. At any rate, I am in your hands. You can take what steps you like. As I've already said, there's no man living who can fear death less than I do. Holmes sat for a little time in silence. What were your plans, he asked at last. I intended to bury myself in Central Africa. My work there is but half finished. Go and do the other half, said Holmes. I, at least, am not prepared to prevent you. Dr. Sterndale raised his giant figure, bowed gravely, and walked from the harbor. Holmes lit his pipe and handed me his pouch. Some fumes which are not poisonous would be welcome change, said he. I think you must agree, Watson, that it is not a case in which we are called upon to interfere. Our investigation has been independent, and our actions shall be so also. You would not denounce the man? Certainly not, said I. I have never loved Watson, but if I did, if the woman I loved had not met such an end, I might act even as a lawless lion hunter has done. Who knows? Well, Watson, I will not offend your intelligence by explaining what is obvious. The gravel upon the window sill was, of course, the starting point of my research. It was unlike anything in the vicarage garden. Only when my attention had been drawn to Dr. Sterndale and his cottage did I find its counterpart. The lamp shining in broad daylight and the remains of powder upon the shield were successive links in the fairly obvious chain. And now, my dear Watson, I think we may discuss, dismiss this matter from our mind and go back with a clear conscience to the study in the Chelan roots, which are surely to be traced in the Cornish branch of the great Celtic speech.